The New Testament is full of references to Abraham as the great father of the faithful. And in the Hall of Fame of Faithful Servants of God found in the Old Testament, we have the inspired writer in Hebrews chapter 11 saying this about Abraham. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out to a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither or whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even as one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. We have that statement written to people to encourage them to be faithful when they're actually thinking about leaving the faith. Then we have James writing in James chapter 2, saying, Was not our father, verse 21, justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. There are various places in the New Testament where Abraham is cited for his faithfulness. In each case, as is true in any age in which God has dealt with man. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that faith is always an obedient faith as was exemplified by the great father of the faithful, Abraham. And while he was so great and so faithful, he lived in the patriarchal age. There was no written law of God. And it's hard for us to carry our minds back to the culture and society of that time where the father offered sacrifices to God and that was the way that God was worshipped. That age of some 2,500 years covered in the Bible from Genesis 1-1 down to the giving of the law of Moses on Mount Sinai to the Jews in Exodus 19 was not a time of written law. And they live basically by what we would call moral law. You don't lie, you don't steal, you don't murder, etc. And it's very interesting to try to picture in our mind even their attitude, the men, toward women. And of course that meant the women toward the men, especially when it came to homes and how they functioned. And when we turn to Genesis chapter 12... We find an area of Abraham's life that is not a pleasant one to look at. But it does remind us that he was a human being just like us. You find the marvelous statement of God, promise of God to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord said unto him, that is Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And notice the very next verse, so Abraham departed. That says a lot about Abraham when we were first introduced to him here. When he understood God's will for his life, he immediately acted. There was no gainsaying. There was no trying to get out of it. There was no trying to alter it. When he understand that God was speaking to him, and he understood the obligation laid upon his shoulders, he immediately 
acted. The thing that made Abraham the father of the faithful is because of that attitude. Any time that he knew God's will and that it was for him, you will not find any time in his life that he didn't immediately seek to perform what God told him to do. But this is not the church. This is not under the authority of Christ. This is not the gospel period. Abraham never knew a lot of the things we know. Nobody did who lived before the revelation of the New Testament and the establishment of the church is recorded in Acts chapter 2. That's one reason why you have stated by Paul in the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Now he said that to pagans on Mars Hill regarding a lot of things they were doing that under the authority of Christ would not be permitted any longer. God tolerated a lot of things among people. One of them was polygamy. And yet we see that uh, grace, which is favor, abounded to Abraham as he demonstrated his faithful obedience to him and all that God told him to do. But after we leave these promises that God made to Abraham, we see that a great famine comes upon the land. And verse 10 says, Abraham went down into Egypt to live there. And it says the famine was not just bad, but it was grievous. And it came to pass when he came near to enter into Egypt, <clears throat> that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore, it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. He continues speaking to Sarai, Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. I think it would be good to come in here that this is one of two times that Abraham did this. And Sarah was privy to it and in agreement with it. You will find out later that Isaac, his son, did the same thing. And he did it with one of the ones Abraham did it with. These things may be very difficult for us to understand. And I do not try to condone what he did except to say, under the law in which they live, the patriarchal age, these things many times were put up with and tolerated, even as polygamy was. And notice what happens. And you know, these things that I say many times weren't just put in there to take up space. And since Paul said these things are written aforetime for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures, he's talking about Old Testament scriptures, we might have hope, Romans 15, 4. There must be something that helps me live the Christian life today, that helps me appreciate things in this man whom God called the father of the faithful. Now, first of all, let it be understood <clears throat> that Sarah was his sister. She was his half-sister. So in those days, in those families, that was perfectly acceptable to call someone your sister when they were half-sister. But you can see how things were regarding even who you took to be your mate as a wife. Because you wouldn't think about people today choosing a half-sister to be a wife. And yet, when you go back to the beginning of things, <clears throat> Adam and Eve were the father of all, so I says, where did Cain get his wife? He married a sister. All there is to it. Now, you've got to also realize something that's different then than now is the great length of years in which they lived. And the vast separation must have existed between some of the brothers and sisters, not all of them, in Adam's family. So get out of your mind where we are today. Get out of your mind the way we think today. Put your mind where they were in the patriarchal age and how God dealt with them in what has been called the starlight period. 
That is, God is revealing gradually down through many years how he would save man. And that wouldn't come almost 4,000 or so years later from this time period. Now, in verse 14, And it came to pass when Abram was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. The princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And he entreated Abram well for her sake. And then he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh in his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is it? What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to me to me to wife. Now therefore behold thy wife, take thee and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him. They sent him away, his wife, and all that he had. Note this about Abraham when he's talking to Sarah. Everything you do because I'm concerned about me. You notice that? Everything you do to protect me. And she agreed to it. Now, how is it that he could be the father of the faithful? If you will notice, this is Abraham and Sarah and I working this out. And this is Abraham's conjured up idea of how to save himself. There's been no revelation of God to Abraham here. None whatsoever. Moses does not record it. Let me remind you again. Every time, every time that you find God speaking to Abraham and telling him something to do, he immediately set about to do it, no questions asked. That's why he's the father of the faithful. But he's a human like anybody else. And you've got to get the picture of those days in the tribal type situations. And Egypt was a very old empire. And because of where it was on the Nile River, usually when there was a famine, there was always food in Egypt. Remember that when it comes to Jacob and the account of Joseph and what all happened there years later. <clears throat> this tells me something, though. Part of the truth is not all of the truth. And the motive behind the telling of the thing you tell can be very selfish indeed. And it can involve somebody else and putting her in a Can you imagine how Sarah felt when she was taken into Pharaoh's house knowing he intended to have her as a wife? And what is Abraham doing? Well, mum's the word. And on top of that, you want to know where Abraham got a lot of his flocks and herds? Pharaoh paid him with it for Sarah. This tells us a lot about them when it comes to their humanity and when they acted on their own. Let me say again, why is Abraham the father of the faithful? Not because of these things. But because every time God told him to do something, he immediately set about to do it, and he never one time backed off from doing it. But now he's left to himself, and this is what happens. And it all comes up that God curses Pharaoh's house. Do you remember the promise earlier in chapter 12 before we come into this account? I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. Let me ask you a question. Is God true to his promise to Abraham? God does not go back on his promises. He knows what he's dealing with in Abraham. He's going to watch Abraham grow and develop in faith until he can tell him in chapter 22, take thy son, thy son whom thou lovest, and you offer him as a burnt offering. He already had a great deal of faith for him to call him out of the land of his nativity and say, go, well, where am I going? I'm not telling you, go. And what did we see out of that? He immediately moved, verse 4, so Abraham departed without knowing whither he went. Thus you've got what we read in Hebrews 11 in that great chapter on faithful service to God. Why Abraham is who he is. 
And yet here we see his humanity, his weakness to protect himself, to use his wife in doing it, and not open his mouth at all when he takes her, Pharaoh does, into his harem is what was going to happen, and even receives a lot of gifts from Pharaoh. And yet what does God do? God hasn't forgot his promises. He curses Pharaoh. Now somewhere or another, they were able to say, we weren't having a bad time until this woman came in this house. And then everything happened. All sorts of problems came upon us. And it caused Pharaoh to say, why didn't you tell me? Evidently the news got out to him or he couldn't have asked Abraham the questions. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? And it teaches us when you withhold information that is necessary so somebody can have the wherewithal to act properly, you might as well have lied. Because in effect, what did Pharaoh believe regarding Abraham when he said, she's my sister? Well, he thought she's eligible. That's exactly what he thought. And we know the rest of it. The Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away, and his wife, and all he had. Now, he had the power to kill him if he wanted to. I think we see God's providence working here, but we also see God keeping his promise, even when Abraham did what he did. It's deceptive what he did. And that's one reason in the oaths that you promised to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And Abraham didn't do that. Well, did the man really learn his lesson? Well, we come over later on, and we have an even more detailed account of this same type of conduct on the part of Abraham and Sarah. Chapter 20. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night, God true to his promises, and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. I think that would get my attention. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister? Now, I don't have to go any further than that to understand what Abimelech understood about the comment Abraham had made to him about Sarah, that she is my sister. And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. Now we learn something, how complicit she is on this. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. And that's amazing to me. God knows the integrity of the heart of Abimelech. He's made his promises to Abraham and what he intends to do through Abraham and his seed, developing into Israel and finally all the way down through Israel, the tribe of Judah, the family of David, the Christ according to the flesh would come. But again, let me ask you, why is Abraham the father of the faithful? Because any time God commanded him to do anything, there was no gainsaying, there was no quibbling, there was no whining. He immediately set to do it. But left to his own machinations, his own human fears, his own human conjuring, you see what it gets him into, but God stands by. Not to, there's nowhere is, this, is God condoning what Abraham did, but he protected evidently Pharaoh, and he protected definitely here Abimelech, for God says so. Now, notice how he starts verse 7. Now, therefore, in the light of the facts... Of preceding verses. Restore the man his wife. Now watch. For he is a prophet. And he shall pray for thee. And thou shalt live. 
And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Well, that get the man up early in the morning. Therefore, Abimelech rose up early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their ears, and the men were so afraid. Remember, this is the patriarchal age. God at sundry times in divers manners spake in time past and the fathers by the prophets. So he works with the head of families. There is no one nation out of all the other nations as there would be when Israel was created under the law of Moses. The whole world can either be serving God or not, but it would be in the patriarchy system. Then Abimelech called Abraham. I like the way Abimelech deals with Abraham. And said unto him, what hast thou done unto us? Now think about that for a minute. What had Abraham done at all? It all involved what he said. He didn't tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. He deceived Abimelech. God's even testified to Abimelech's integrity. He said, I know you're a man of integrity. After Abimelech had brought it up, I, I was innocent in what I did. I was honest in what I did. I thought she was eligible. How do, I, how do we know that? Because Moses, by inspiration, recorded the very words of Abimelech. Did not this man say, she's my sister, and did she not say, he's my brother? So what hast thou done unto us? You know, we can do a lot of things to a lot of people by just withholding part of the truth, telling it like we like to tell it. Telling always when you do that, mark it down. When you tell it like you like to tell it, it's always going to favor you. Now, remember back here when it comes to Pharaoh earlier, all that came out of the idea, you're so pretty, you're so beautiful. When they see you, they're going to kill me to get you. You know, in the last several years is not just the beginning of the me, me, me concept. Abraham exemplifies it pretty well right here. You do this because what may happen to me. Okay. Then the building that called Abraham said, And what hast thou done to us? And what have I offended thee? Have I hurt you some way? What have I done wrong against you? That thou brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin. Well, here's a man to recognize that if I'd done this thing, taking her as my wife, I would have sinned. Well, I'd like to get people today to realize that. When you do something under the false pretenses by not telling all the truth necessary for somebody to make a proper uh, view, draw a proper conclusion, written to four times for our learning, not just taking up space to help you live under the authority of Christ in the New Testament, you would sin. Thy hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. That ought not to be done. Ought is used to say it's morally wrong. You violated morality. Because remember, this is the patriarchy, mainly governed by moral law. No lying, no murder, no theft, such like. But he did. And Abraham said, and Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? He's probing him. I like that. He's interrogating him is what he's doing. With people who are usually criminal in some way or the other, are at fault somewhere or the other. Do not like questions. I wonder what's going on in Abraham's mind. Well, now watch. And Abraham said, this sounds like 2 Kings 5 and Naaman, because I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. Big chicken. And yet indeed, she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. Well, that's nice to know. Why didn't you say it earlier? Because it's obvious Abimelech thought that she was eligible when he said, she's my sister. And she said, he's my brother. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said unto her, this is thy kindness which thou shalt... Now, you notice how much Abraham has the me, me, me syndrome. Kindness which thou shalt show unto me at every place. Every place. See, this was not just what they did in these two cases. This was planned as they started to wander. 
This is how we're going to protect ourselves. Now, you can sit here and criticize him harshly, but if you were in about 1850 and starting to cross on frontier in an old wagon and you had about 10 kids going with you, and maybe you were with a wagon train, you start going through Comanche country, and uh, you're going to be a little bit on your guard. So, at every place whither we shall come, say of me, he's my brother, and Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him Sarah to wife, his wife. I'd like to have known Abimelech because Abimelech was very upset at him because you didn't tell me the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about Sarah. And you could have got me in big trouble with God. And he knew that firsthand from what God told him. And yet he understood the fear of Abraham in traveling in that country. And he does not condone what Abraham does, but he does lay it aside. And now we see something about grace and mercy on Abimelech's part. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleaseth thee. And unto Sarah, he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. I always found it interesting that he said thy brother. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes and to all that are with thee and will, and will other and with all other. Thus she was reproved. So Abraham prayed unto God and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maid servants and they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wounds of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Does God keep his promises to Abraham? He certainly does. I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. Has Abraham learned a lesson? Well, I don't know whether he has or not. Does Abraham obey God every single solitary time God tells him to do something? He certainly does. And it's because of that obedience that he's saved, not because of his human frailties. And evidently, somebody's beholding all of this, and it was Isaac. Because guess what? Isaac does the same thing to Abimelech that Abraham does. Now, if I, if I were Abimelech, I think I'd back off that family. And if you follow Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob's children, you see this deceitfulness showing up all over the place. Remember, Jacob's involvement with his daddy steal the birthright from Esau. Remember how when God sent him up to his mother's brother in Haran, and boy, he met his match in that guy being deceitful. And so you see all of this working. Now watch it. Whether it's Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, and it comes right down to Joseph. Whenever God said, you do this, they never questioned him. They did it. There is no written testament for them to read every day. They know how to worship God by sacrifices. This they do regularly because they believe confidently in the God who is revealing himself. But left to their own devices at times, out of fear, out of whatever plagues all humans, they failed when they came up with her own way of doing things. Now, when it comes to the birth of Isaac, God works in his own good time, not in yours or mine. God had promised Abraham that through thy seed shall all the earth be blessed, and it's going to be through Sarah, through a child you will bear with Sarah. But do you remember? They got impatient with God. Normally, biologically, they were way past childbearing age. And so, the Women's Aid Society comes in with their plan. And Sarah says, here, here's Hagar, my handmaid. Have that child by her. I can't have children. Have that child by her. So Abraham did. God never said that. God had told them Sarah would have a baby. They were impatient. And thus you had a whole nation develop out of Ishmael. And to this day their descendants are in this world. 
All because Sarah came up with this idea that would help perform what God promised in her mind. And Abraham listened to her. Later on, you will see in that historical account that Sarah doesn't like it because Ishmael is quite a bit older than Isaac. And she says, get him out and send the mother out. And this, this hurt Abraham. And God had to intervene and say, no, you listen to Sarah on this one. So they sent Hagar and Ishmael out. And he became a great nation. Paul uses this to teach the superiority of the New Testament system in the book of Galatians in battling the Judaizing teachers of that day and time. That it was through the actual wife of Abraham that the promised child came. Brethren, we need to realize, and this is the main point of this, not really the great faith of Abraham, although that's always good to see that any time God tells us something to do, we act immediately. We don't try to get out of it. But we need to realize also the weakness of Abraham and Sarah and how we can fear for ourselves and be just full of fear. And left to our own devices, we make a mess of it. And we get other people in trouble who are sincere and good. Pharaoh and Abimelech were only doing good things. And you see the declaration of Abimelech. That I was honest and in integrity of my heart. I was sincere. I did these things. Notice God who knows all that the object of knowledge is. I know all about it. That's the reason I intervened and stopped you from sinning. I heard prayed even this morning. And I pray it all the time. And I know you do. Defeat us in evil and raise us up in good. Now, what happened in the case of God dealing with Abimelech to stop him from sinning? He said, I intervened. I stopped you from sinning. I don't understand how all that works. I'm glad I don't have to. If we love the Lord and keep his commandments and strive with all of our heart to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things should be added unto us, and God will help us as we constantly strive to live according to the authority of Jesus Christ's word and obedience to the gospel in every way. That's the difference in a person who's lost or unfaithful and in the person who's walking straight and narrow way to heaven. He never ceases, or she never ceases, to strive to do what God says immediately as soon as they learn it. They alter their lives to complete the pattern. But left our devices, sometimes we stumble and fall. And God's good providence works things out many times. But not to the person who's not seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now look at all the accounts in the New Testament of Abraham, and they hold him up. As he does in Hebrews 11, specifically, that he looked for a place that has foundations, a city that hath foundations. He had none here, whose builder and maker is God. That never left Abraham. He always had the goal and was working toward the goal of serving God as his word said and every time God spoke to him to do something, he did it. Now that's your example and my example. That's what it is to be faithful. And thus he's the author of eternal salvation. Jesus Christ is. Author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. That's the lesson of faithfulness. The other is tell the truth the whole truth, nothing not the truth. And don't be a me, me, me person that uses other folks and doesn't mind even getting them into trouble. You know, if Abraham had really thought on this thing, he'd say, now if I get somebody into trouble, God has promised me he's going to curse them. You see, Abraham was the reason that Abimelech's house and Pharaoh's house had plagues come upon it. And yet here were men who didn't know what was going on. And Abimelech makes it clear that I was honest and sincere and a man of integrity. And God said, I know it. Isn't that amazing? i tell you a little bit of how God can answer prayers. Because he knows he's in control of every single solitary person and situation on this earth. I'm glad I serve God like that. Sometimes when you're bended knee, trying to find the words in your prayers to express the thoughts of your heart, you know if you can't find them to where they will exactly express of ideas on your mind God knows 
And we sing the song sometimes that says, Jesus knows, Jesus cares. What is our duty? Fear God and keep his commandments. Well, this is the whole duty of man. If we do that, God will work it all out for us. It may put us through some strains. It may cause our hands to get slapped because we had them in the wrong place. It may cause a number of things. But we do not stop doing what we know the Bible says, no matter what. We're always striving to walk the straight and narrow way. We're willing to correct ourselves when we see we deviate from the truth. And we always do things out of the integrity, sincerity of our heart. If you're not a child of God this morning, then we plead with you to have the faith of Abraham. To come to that same God through His Son, Jesus Christ. That same God that worked with Abraham. And emulate Him in faithful obedience to the gospel and being baptized in Christ for the remission of sins. And live righteously before Him in our Lord's church, the spiritual body of Christ. As a Christian, if you haven't been living as the New Testament teaches, it's simple as far as what you must do. And to bring yourself in subjection to it may be something else. But you need to repent of your sins. Confess those sins, and we'll pray with you and for you that your sins be forgiven. But know this one thing. God wants you to be saved. God wants you to be saved and to be in heaven with him. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, please come while we stand and sing.